on uh, YouTube, so you can go back and reference them if you need. And let's go over here. So I think, please work. Why didn't I try this first? You know what that's asking. Let's see, so it's not. Oh, I guess I wanted to know whether I wanted that app. Fingers crossed. We have very little, hopefully we have very few technologies. All right, so first thing we're going to do is uh, talk about displacement and distance traveled, how that relates to velocity. So this should be a familiar topic to you. The, okay, let's see. I think if I click there, I think we just have to go to navigate and say sections only or only pages. Okay, that should be fine. Okay, so the uh, idea is that with displacement, we're gonna, we're imagining some object moving. We've got uh, its position at time A. We've got its final position, or which we're gonna call position at time B. And the displacement is simply the terminal position minus the initial position. So final minus initial, and that gives us our displacement. And if we are moving in the direction of positive orientation, displacement is always positive. So for us, 99% of the time, we're imagining the positive x-axis as our, as our path of travel, and we're imagining the positive direction to the right. So most of the time. There's certain times where you want to have your axis of travel vertical or something else. If we have it horizontal like that, usually that's going to be the positive direction. So if we end up to the right of where we started, we have positive displacement. Similarly, if we started at position A, ended up over here at position B, that's the positive orientation. That direction will have negative displacement. So displacement can be positive or negative depending on which direction you're going. <coughs> I think that will work. Okay. And we have a nice mathematical way to represent displacement with an integral. We know that if we integrate the velocity, we can replace that V with S prime, position the position's derivative is the velocity, right? And we know that the integral and the derivative undo each other. So we will end up with the antiderivative for s prime is s. s at the upper limit is s of b. s at the lower limit is s of a. Voila, that is displacement, s of b minus s of a. So conceptually, we know that displacement is terminal position minus initial position. Mathematically, we now see that, oh, that corresponds to the integral of velocity. So integral of velocity gives us displacement. It can be positive or negative. Any questions with that? Does that make sense? We can also look at this visually with a, with a graph. So the uh, velocity being positive means the movement is in the positive direction. Velocity being negative would mean movement is in the negative direction. So if we graph the velocity curve, which we see right here, the velocity curve is positive here. And the area beneath that curve, we know that that integral we just saw can correspond to area beneath the curve. So if we integrate velocity and velocity happens to be positive, this area up here represents um, the movement in the positive direction. Now down here where the velocity becomes negative, that means that our object 
was moving in the positive direction, and then it stopped, and then it started moving in the negative direction. So right here, where the velocity is zero, that's where it changes direction. So it's moving in the positive direction, stops, turns around, moves in the negative direction. Didn't move quite as far in the negative direction as it did in the positive direction. The displacement will be positive in this case. We do the upper area minus the lower area. Still, mathematically, it's just the integral of velocity. We don't have to do anything except integrate velocity from A to B. And it does all the work for us. The beauty of the integral symbol. Now, the difference between displacement and distance traveled. Obviously, distance traveled is never negative. Displacement can be negative if you moved more in the negative direction. Distance traveled, all we have to do is take the absolute value of velocity and integrate it. That's a piecewise defined function, the absolute value function. Graphically, this is what the absolute value of v would look like. We just take that curve that's below the x-axis or the t-axis and fold it up into the uh, upper, into quadrant one. And distance traveled will be the sum of those two areas. OK, let's see if we can answer some questions here. So we've got this curve representing velocity. So we have velocity as a function of, of time. And the first thing, first part A says, on what intervals is the object moving in the negative direction? All right, so what would our, what's the first interval that we see? Zero to two. Zero to two, right. So for part A, we're seeing the interval zero to two. And we are going to use parentheses because at zero and at two, there is no movement. The velocity is zero. So it's not moving in either direction at that moment. So open interval. And then our second interval that we see would four be to six. four to six, moving in the negative direction. So those are our two intervals. What is the displacement of the object over the interval 2 comma 6? So 2 to 6, we're going to, let's see, we're going right there. And it's asking for displacement. So that's going to be the upper minus the lower area. It's going to be the change in area. And so we're going to have 14 minus 10. Is that what I heard for? Everyone agree? Now, if it asked for distance traveled on that interval, the answer would be? 24. 24. Perfecto. What is the total distance traveled we between? We just said that, didn't we? Zero, but between 0 and 6, not 4 and 6. So between 0 and 6, the distance traveled is? 44. Say again? 44. 44. Uh, distance traveled, so I should have a plus. Thank you. Traveled, 44. Uh, what is the displacement on 0, 8? So displacement all the way across the whole interval. We'll take the upper areas, subtract off the lower areas. So we're going to have 20 minus negative 10, 30. So we'll end up with a negative 10 displacement. All that means is that we ended up 10 units to the left of where we started. And then part E says, describe the position of the, oh, just did the, oh, no, after, oh yeah, we just said that. So after eight seconds, the object is 10 units to the left of where it started. Make sense? Very intuitive. Ten units left of initial position. Now, do we know where that is? We don't. Because we're not told where the initial position is. We're told what the velocity at time zero is, but we're not told the position at time zero. So if we had an extra piece of information, <coughs> if we were told that the initial position was at, say, s equals three, then we would subtract 10 from 3, and our terminal position would be at negative 7. 
But in this, we're not told the initial position, so we can't actually figure out what exactly the terminal position is. All we can do is describe it. It's 10 units to the left of where we started. Where is the is it view? Must be view. <clears throat> so summary here. Velocity is the rate of change of position, also known as the derivative. The displacement of an object between A and B, if B is bigger than A, is going to be S of B minus S of A, which is just the integral of velocity. And distance traveled is the integral of the absolute value of velocity. The absolute value of velocity is referred to as speed. So absolute value of velocity is speed. So you integrate velocity to get displacement. You integrate speed to get distance traveled. Um, we are going to have two methods that we are going to use to calculate the position at time t. This is a more sophisticated view of finding the position at time t. There's going to be a way that I think you probably did in Calc 1 or maybe in physics if you took physics 1, where you would integrate v, get an antiderivative, plug in some initial condition and solve for c, and you could get your function for position. This is a little more sophisticated <coughs> excuse me, method. This says that our position at time t will be the initial position plus the displacement on time interval 0 to t. So this integral right here represents time interval 0 to t. Right, that represents the displacement on that interval. And if we know the initial position, then we can get the position at any time t. So just like that last example, where we couldn't tell what our terminal position was because we didn't know where we started. Here, we say, OK, well, the position at time t will be the initial position plus the future displacement on the interval from 0 to t. So that's the method that we're going to use to find s of t in this way. We're going to call that the, the um, fundamental theorem of calculus method. Question? Um, yeah, why aren't you integrating with respect to because you cannot have this letter here and that letter there be the same. So the letter that is inside the integral and part of the differential is called a dummy variable. That variable is just there temporarily, and then it vanishes. So for example, when we see something like this, if we are integrating some function of t, say 2t cubed dt, and we're going to go from 0 to 3, this is not, this expression is a constant. This is not a function. This is a constant. That variable that we see is a dummy variable because it vanishes. This is going to be 2t to the 4 over 4 on the interval 0 to 3. And so we're going to end up with 1 half times 3 to the fourth, which will be 81 thirds. So that's a constant. Right? That letter in there is just a dummy variable. It's a placeholder. It allows us to do the integration. This, on the other hand, right here, this is a function of t. Because right, in the end, when you plug in the 0 and t after you've done the integration, you replace the x's, you're going to replace it with the t. So that will end up being a function of t. And let's just do a simple example of that. So for example, if we integrate 0 to t, we, again, we can't have this function variable uh, be confused with the with the um, dummy variable of the integration. So when we integrate here, we're going to get x squared from 0 to t. We end up with t squared. So our distinction is that this is a constant. 
where as this is a function of t. So yeah, good question. Let's take a look at this one. So consider an object moving along a line with velocity v, t is in seconds, velocity is meters per second. Determine when the motion is in the positive direction and when it is in the negative direction. Find displacement and distance. It's very helpful to graph. If you have a graph, as we saw in the prior examples, you can just look at the graph and it all kind of unravels really nicely. So it's super important to be able to graph. And let's go ahead and take a look at this velocity function. My recommendation here would be to factor out the, let's see, I guess I have to use the pen to erase. Okay. So I would factor out the 3t here. This will be t minus 2. Then we know, right, we know it's a parabola. And we could obviously put it in standard form, X, the, the vertex form, I guess they call it these days. Um, but the factoring of it, we know that parabolas have symmetry around the axis of symmetry. If we know two zeros, we know the axis of symmetry is right between the two zeros. So that's a pretty quick way to get to it. Let's see, I think. Let's try that. Okay, so our zeros, oops, I want that. Okay, so our zeros are going to be here and here. And we know that this parabola is opening upward because it's positive on the square. So we know that the vertex is down there somewhere. <coughs> now we don't really care where it is. Um, we can plug in 1 and find out exactly what the value is, so we would get 3 times negative 1, so it's down at negative 3. If we want to be precise, you know, we can do that. We don't, we don't really have to be precise, though, in this case, because we already know what's happening. We know that it's above the x-axis or the t-axis as soon as we get to 2. And again, we don't really need to know what the value is at 3, but you know, it's going to be up there at 9 or something. So depending on how precise we want to get, there's our graph. And we have this region below the t-axis. And we have this region above the t-axis. And so let's see, part A, determine when the motion is in the positive direction and when it's in the negative direction. So let's go ahead and answer that. So part A. Let's go negative direction first. Ne negative direction, what interval would we be moving in the negative direction? Zero to two. Zero to two. Open intervals. And then moving in the positive direction is then from two to three. Part B says find the displacement over the given interval. Displacement. We love it when we're asked displacement, because all we have to do is integrate. And we're good at integration. We don't have to do anything weird. We don't have to deal with absolute values. So all we have to do is integrate our velocity function on the given interval. That will be displacement automatically. So we like that. Displacement. So that means initial position, terminal position are aligned. They coincide. Find the distance traveled over the given interval. What will the distance traveled be? Hmm. Four. All right. How'd you get that? Hmm. 
Let's see. I'm not sure that it's four. No, 54. Oh, you said 54? Yes. 54. All right, so, okay, that's, all right, let's, let's see. Here's what I would say. So if we integrate from one, excuse me, two to three, that should give us the area on top. If we integrate from zero to two and multiply by negative one, that would give us the area below. So what should be the case is both those areas match. And your, your supposition is that they're both 27. Let's check. So let's integrate this function from, if we go from 0 to 2 and multiply by negative 1, this will give us the area of the green region. Everyone agree with that? So that is going to be, we can just look up here, so that's going to be negative t cubed plus 3t squared from 0 to 2. 0 is a non-contributor, we get negative 8 plus 12, which is 4. So the area is actually 4 in each of those regions. And so what you see, what you were thinking was that this is one area, this is the other, but you have to remember that this minus is combining in there. And so that minus is why it's not quite what it might have seemed it was going to be. And if we integrate from 2 to 3, we'll also get 4. So the answer then is distance traveled is going to be 8. So this implies distance is equal to 8. That will be our... So then if the displacement if the displacement is equal, does that mean that the areas have to be equal if they're both positive and negative? So the display, if the displacements are equal, so if the displacement, well, the displacement um, on this interval, say that again? Well, okay, so like we assumed here that the, that the positive area was equal to the negative area. Yes. Because, and we assume that because the displacement because the zero. distance, because the uh, displacement was zero. Right. So, so no matter what, that will always be. Yes. The if the displacement is zero, the upper area and the lower area have to match. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So if the displacement is zero, upper area, lower area are always going to be equal. Yeah. Okay, how about this one? So here we have an exponential function. Again, let's go ahead and draw a sketch of it so that we get a sense of what it's looking like. Do that. Okay. So my finger, okay, just gotta figure out. These smart boards are all multi-touch, so a magnetic pen is gonna do something different than something non-magnetic. Gotta figure out how that works out with one note. Okay, so this exponential function, <coughs> If we plug in zero, we're up here with a y-intercept of 50, or a v-intercept. And is this exponential growth or exponential decay? Decay. Decay, so that minus sign right there. And as t goes to infinity, this exponential part is going to zero. So we should be dealing with a graph that looks something like that and we're going to asymptotically be approaching the t-axis. Okay, now we're only concerned on the interval 0 to 4, so we've got our subinterval there that we're looking at, 0 to 4, and we can imagine the area beneath the curve right in here. So let's go ahead and answer the same questions. Uh, let's see. When it's a positive and negative displacement and distance, okay. It's always going to be positive, so 0 to 4. So this curve is always above the t-axis, so we know that velocity is always positive on this interval, so certainly we can make the conclusion that it is um, positive on 0, 4. I should have an open interval. And what is the 
total displacement then. Displacement is just the integral. So we're going to straight up integration. So that's displacement. We'll integrate 0 to 4, 50e to the minus 2t. So we'll integrate this. And I don't know how well you can integrate with the reverse chain rule. That's what I'm about to use is the reverse chain rule. We'll look at a couple examples of reverse chain rule in one second, but that's how I'm going to do that right here. So the integral of an exponential is itself divided by the derivative of the exponent. That's the reverse chain rule. Now, when, you're, when you have your integration training wheels on, you would use u substitution. You would say, oh, let's let u be negative 2t. du will be negative 2 dt. Divide by negative 2. There's the divide by negative 2. In Calc 2, we take off the integration training wheels, and we will use, um, we'll use this method. So I'll look at a few examples just to emphasize what I'm doing with this reverse chain rule in one second. <coughs> So this will be negative 25 e to the negative 8 minus plugging in 0 will give e to the 0, which is 1. So there is our answer. And we can we could move that around in a couple of different ways. You know, we could distribute the minus if we wanted. Do that. That won't work. Let me take away that dot. I guess I just have to do that. Okay, so that is the displacement on the interval from 0 to 4. And the last question, I think, just said find the distance traveled. Is there a difference here? No. No, it will be exactly the same. Exactly. Because the curve is always, the velocity is always positive, displacement and distance traveled will match when we're dealing with all positive velocity. So C will have the exact same answer, distance. And here, I'm I don't like that negative out in front. Makes me feel like the distance is negative, even though it's not. The distance traveled, so I'll just distribute the minus, write it that way. And that will be our distance traveled. OK, let's do a couple of reverse chain rule just to make sure that you are on board with reverse chain rule. So, and it's essential that you get on board with reverse chain rule. So, let's look at a few examples. So, first example, let's suppose we have f of x equals um, let's do e to the 3x. <clears throat> so now I am going to use the chain rule. So that's that. So the chain rule is where you multiply by the derivative of the exponent. Now let's do reverse chain rule. So reverse chain rule we are going to divide by the derivative of the exponent. This is reverse chain rule. OK, so now let me justify that to you. So the training wheel version of integration is what you learn at the end of Calc 1. And that's like, oh yeah, I'm going to let u equal 3x. So du will be 3dx. Isolate the dx. And that's going to give us an integral 
of e to the u, and dx is du over 3, and the over 3 can be thought of as a division by 3 out in front. And that gives us the integral of an exponential is just itself. But then we have to do our back substitution, 3x. So there is our justification as to how we, why reverse chain rule will work. So it works when the exponent is linear. Only when the exponent is linear. So let's look at another one. So what about uh, if we have something like y equals cosine of 4x? And we want to integrate that. I guess that. So if we were going to differentiate it, we would use the chain rule. So the derivative of the function cosine is minus sine of the same angle multiplied by 4. And if we were going to integrate it, instead of multiplying by 4, we just divide by 4. We do that. So that is reverse chain rule. We'll see it a ton, especially with trig functions and exponentials. And same reverse chain rule, if we did u equals 4x, du would be 4dx, divide by 4 to isolate dx, that's where the division by 4 comes from. Would it be negative? Uh, when we integrate cosine, you get positive sine. The derivative of cosine is minus sine, but the integral of cosine is positive sine because the derivative of sine is cosine. All right, so a little reverse chain rule. Obviously, if you're fiddling around doing derivatives or integrals and you're not 100% sure, just ask. I do not mind prerequisite questions. I know that there's some teachers that are really, you know, not happy answering prerequisite questions in calculus. Learning calculus is like rowing a leaky boat. And it's like you just have to fill in all the holes that you have. Like you, all of us have calculus holes. We've learned most of a lot, a lot we, we've learned most of a lot of things, but there's always a few little holes. We just have to fill in. Question? I'm trying to remember for my, I took discrete, discrete mathematics. That's discrete mathematics, right? Um, or similar to it? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> like discrete math is, uh, if we don't offer it here, so, and I've never taken it. Discrete math is typically a practical math that you take if you're a computer science major. Um, so you probably learn a lot of uh, sort of shortcuts for how you do computation. Yeah. So I, I would not be surprised. Okay. Yeah. All right, we'll do one more of these, and then we'll take a break. Um, actually, I think I want to take the break now, because this is, this is kind of an involved problem. We want to build the position function from velocity, and we're going to do it two ways. Let's not break it up, so let's go ahead and take our 10-minute break now. Um, see you back in 10 minutes. So here we want to find position from velocity, and conceptually we know, oh, integrate velocity, we'll get position. Right? That's, we know that from prior, prior classes. <coughs> so it is going to ask us, to do this in two ways. They want us to use the FTC, the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, and they also want us to use a constant of integration. So they're going to call this the antiderivative method. That's sort of the method that you're probably familiar with. Let's do it that way first. So we will uh, find the position, so S of T, we will integrate the derivative, which is the velocity. And now here, we're, we're dealing with, um, with the function of t, and we want to integrate it. And if we don't put limits on here, if we just use an indefinite integral, it's totally fine to have a t in there. <clears throat> if it's an indefinite integral, there's not limits of integration. 
Right, we, then we don't have to worry. There's no conflict between the limits of integration and that t. So we can do that. <coughs> so we integrate sine, and we get negative cosine of t plus c. So with the antiderivative method, it's going to boil down to figuring out what the c is. We need to figure out what that c is represented by. Well, we use this initial value right there. So we know that s of 0 is equal to 1. So s of 0 is also equal to minus cosine of 0 plus t, plus c, excuse me, plus c. <clears throat> so here we end up with 1 is equal to cosine of 0 is 1, so that's negative 1 plus c. So we end up with <clears throat> c being 2. So that tells us, let's put it down here. So that tells us that s of t is going to be negative cosine t plus 2. So that is the position at time t. We can plug in any number between 0 and 2 pi. We can even plug in other numbers, too, if this is expanded. If we have this good on a bigger interval, we could plug in anything within that interval to get the value or the position at that t value. So that is the antiderivative method. <clears throat> any question on antiderivative method? What does the interval have to do with anything? Um, not much. Not much. Um, they could easily have said this goes from minus 2 pi to 2 pi, and we wouldn't have done anything any different. So now, if the question, now the question, so it says determine the position function for t bigger than or equal to 0. Yeah, nothing. Having that in there, it feels like they should be saying something like, well, what's the distance traveled on that interval? What's the displacement on that interval? But they didn't. So for this purpose of finding s from v, doesn't really matter. This is important, though, because that's how we get the constant of integration. Oh, no. Question? OK. So now let's look at the more sophisticated way to do this. And this is using the fundamental theorem of calculus method not the antiderivative method. So let's come over here. And what we would say is that the position at time t, which some, some books will refer to that as the future position, the position at some time t in the future, is the initial position plus the displacement on the interval 0 to t So it looked like that. So here is where we have to be careful with the t and the x. We want to end up with a function of t. And so we're going to let t be up there in the variable, in the limit position. So that's going to be a variable up there, but that x is not a variable. It's going to just go away. So let's see, do we get the same thing? So s of t will equal 1. Right, we're given s of 0 is 1 plus the integral from 0 to t. Now the function, the velocity function is sine of t, but we're converting it to x's for the purpose of integration. So we're going to write it like that. And let's see, will we end up with the same thing? The integral of sine is minus cosine. We have it interval from 0 to t. This will be 1 minus cosine of t. <clears throat> and then we have to subtract a <coughs> negative cosine of 0. So minus, minus will be plus cosine of 0, which is 1. And of course, we end up with the same thing, 2 minus cosine of t. So either way works. This way is a little more mathy. This way is, um, you know, just a little bit um, more like physics people might do it more like that. 
Yeah. On exams, will we be asked to do to solve problems in a certain way, or can we solve them however we want? Most of the time, you can solve them however you want. Okay. Most of the time, I'll say find the function s of t using a method of your choice. If I want you to do it a specific way, I'll make sure to emphasize that during the review period so you know for sure. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, definitely, I'll make sure that that's not a mystery. All right, so let's try this one. We'll do it both ways. Um, I'll let you guys work on it first, and then I'll do it on the board. So go ahead and do it. Let's do it using the antiderivative method first, so the physics type method first. And then we'll go over that, and then we'll do it the other way. So yeah, bust out a notebook and a pen. and. Raise your hand if you have a question, if you're not sure on how to proceed. <clears throat> now I'm just going to go through names again so I can Start to learn them better. Connor, Trevor. He was here, wasn't he? Oh, who's that that just went out? No, that's not Trevor. He was here, right? I think so. Yeah, I think you're right. And then John Colt, Ricardo, and then Dan, Travis. Alicia, Joel, Ilya, John M, Andrea, Kate, yeah, I know, first Kate, uh, Panera, KP. KP. Wait, did you ask for Andrea? Yeah. I heard Gabriella. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I caught that. <laughs> Matthew, Jackson, Alejandro, Evan, Gabriella, William, Kate S, and then Neil and Cole. Right here. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah, yeah, you're, uh, you're <coughs> locked out, I got you. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to go through names. This is a small enough class. I haven't had a Calc 2 class with just 20 in a long time. Three questions you want to ask? Oh, to hear voices. Uh, yeah. oh. 
Cannot be in a Zoom room. Uh, we'll still go zero to t. We're looking for a function on that zero to t interval. But when we do the integration, we're going to have to use that reverse t and we're going to divide by pi. So the pi t there is only going to come into play when we do the integration. It's not going to be the So Okay, so when I integrate, I'm going to say, 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 zero you did it yeah. so now when I do reverse chain, I'm going to do it. Can I just, 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 All right, well, let's go through the, um, this antiderivative method. And so it, it can get a little confusing. You can kind of sort of merge the two methods a little bit together. So you have, just have to be a little careful. With the antiderivative method, you don't have any limits of integration. You're just doing an indefinite integral with the antiderivative method. So, and, and the idea, remember that an anti, when we talk about the indefinite integral, it represents the set of all antiderivatives of a function, right? There's no, there's, a, in, there's always an infinite number of antiderivatives. So the indefinite integral represents the entire family of all these antiderivatives, and that's where the plus C is coming from. So here's how I would think about it. The three is a constant. So it just sits in front. The integral of the function is negative cosine of the same angle. Now the angle is modified because there's a pi times t, so now we have to fiddle with it. So now we have to modify it by dividing by the derivative of the angle. The derivative of the angle is pi. So we'll divide that. That will be our correction factor. That's the reverse chain rule. If you were differentiating this, you would do a multiplication by pi, and that's very intuitive by now when you're differentiating with the chain rule. You take the derivative of the angle and multiply. When you're integrating, you take the derivative of the angle and divide. So that is the reverse, the reverse chain rule step, and then we have our constant of integration. And here's where we go back up. We look at the initial value. And that's going to allow us to solve for c. So s of 0 is 1. So I'm plugging in 1. I'm plugging in 0 for t and 1 for the value of s of 0. So then we come over here. We're plugging in a 0. So we get cosine of 0. All that's divided by pi plus c. Cosine of 0 is 1. So we end up with 1 plus 3 over pi, that's equal to c. <clears throat> Go ahead. So it's negative over here, and then I'm adding it to the 1 to the other side so that I can isolate the c. So we'll move it over to the left. <laughs> so this, so therefore, our 
position in the future is, let's see, we have minus, I'm going to write this as 3 over pi, and then plus our constant of integration, let's put the pi first, 3 over pi plus 1. So that would be our future position. That's our position at time t. We take that constant of integration, and we replace it right there. So that's the antiderivative method. Antiderivative method, no limits of integration, resolve the constant. Now using the other method, using the fundamental theorem method, S of t is the initial position plus the displacement on the interval 0 to t. So with the fundamental theorem method, here's where we have the variable t in the exponent, or in the exponent, in the limit of integration, upper limit of integration. So we can't have a t down in here. We don't want a t down in here when we have a t in the limits of integration. So let's see. So that's going to be 1 plus the integral from 0 to t of 3 sine pi t. Whoops, I put a t. So easy to forget and put a t instead of an put a, put a t instead of an x, but we'll put an x. So that will be 1 plus, we integrate. So the 3 is a constant multiplier, it just sits in front. Integral of sine is minus cosine. So we have minus 3 cosine of pi times x all divided by pi from 0 to t. Plugging in the t first, we get minus, we get 1 minus 3 cosine of pi t over pi. And now we're subtracting off a negative, so we're adding whatever the value of this is at 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, so we're going to get plus 3 over pi. And sure enough, we have the exact same answer. We better have the same answer. So those match. So both methods work, obviously. Understanding this method is really helpful for some other stuff in the future. You absolutely want to have this one nailed down. That should be really intuitive. But try to work towards this. It's really convenient. It's, you can use it in lots of applications, looking at future position, future acceleration, future value, if you're dealing with uh, Applications in economics, lots of different applications. All right, so we are now page six. But I have a question real quick. Yeah, go for it. Uh, so wait, why, why did you put a zero to four interval in that one? Did that matter for that uh, one? No, that does not matter. Okay. Again, it doesn't matter because they don't ask us anything about an interval here. Okay. So if we're just trying to find S, that interval does not matter. Yeah, a little bit of misleading. All right, so we're just going to jump up the derivative ladder. And instead of, find, instead of finding future position, we're going to find future velocity from acceleration. So same concept. The future velocity will be the initial velocity plus I'll call it the change in velocity, not the velocity displacement. That sounds, doesn't sound right. Displacement really means change in position. So we don't want to use that term, displacement. But we can think of, just like we think of displacement as the change in position, we can think of this as the change in velocity. So we'll think of it that way. <coughs> change in velocity. And then this is how you would generalize these ideas if you look down here, this is, this is the future value of q is the initial value of q 
plus the change in Q over the time interval 0 to T. Now, if you replace the zeros here with A, so instead of starting at time 0, you're starting at time A. That's totally fine. So all they did to come up with this was replace the two zeros here with A, and then subtract it to the other side. So this is representing the net change in A. All that's, to find that, you're just subtracting this term to the left side. So that's the only difference. So this is kind of the generalization of this fundamental theorem of calculus application for future value. So let's do one. Let's. Okay, so position and velocity from acceleration. Find the position and velocity of an object moving along a straight line uh, using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so first we're going to jump to the future velocity. Future velocity is the initial velocity plus the change in velocity. <clears throat> and the change in velocity on the interval 0 to t is the integral of acceleration. And of course, this acceleration should look very familiar to you, minus 32 feet per second squared. And we have to remember that we want to use a dx instead of a dt because we have the t used in the limits of integration, so we don't want it to conflict with the differential. So this will be equal to 50 plus, we're going to integrate negative 32. We'll get negative 32x on the interval 0 to t. Then we'll plug in our upper and lower limits. So we'll get 50 minus 32 times t plus 0. So there is our future velocity. Now to get our future position, We are going to use the initial position, s of 0, plus, now here we can use the expression displacement. So plus the displacement on the time interval 0 to t. So we're going to integrate the velocity. But we want to change the variable so that we don't have a conflict between the differential and the variable in the limit, in the limit of integration. So that gives us S sub 0 is 0. So we're going to end up with 50x minus uh, 16x squared from 0 to t. So we end up with 50 times t minus 16 times t squared. So that will be our, those will be our two future values. Good. Blowing out the cobwebs? Slightly. Slightly. <laughs> Hopefully not adding to them. <laughs> yeah, it's a big difference doing real math, not Zoom math. Okay, so let's jump to our last page of chapter 6, section 1. On page 7, we had another problem. Oh, there it? is. Thank you. Yep. Oh, right there. How about that? I'll leave that one for you to do. You can, you can work on it. Um, we've got to get into 6-2. We can go over it on Tuesday, on Thursday. Um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. But, so give that a shot between now and Thursday, and then we'll go over it on Thursday. 
We already did one exponential with a reverse chain rule, so remember you'll divide by negative one when you integrate the reverse chain rule. We'll do, we'll do an application, one that's gonna be very comparable. So population of foxes is observed to fluctuate on a 10 year cycle due to variations in the, in the availability of prey. When the population measurements began, so that's gonna be our initial value, the population was 35. Growth rate of foxes per year is observed to be that. So they're thinking that's gonna be a good predictor for the next 10 years. So what is the population 15 years later, 35 years later? So we have the rate of change and we want the future value. So very similar to finding future position from its rate of change, we're gonna find the future value of P from its rate of change. So P of T, P of T, oh, interesting, okay, that's how the undo button works. All right, so the P of T will be the initial population, plus the change in population on the time interval zero to t. <clears throat> now we're integrating with a t in the upper limit of integration, so we can't have a t inside here. So we'll switch it to x. So that'll be our population in the future, population at time t. So 35 foxes to begin with. And then we integrate term by term. Integral of a constant is that constant times the variable of integration, the dummy variable, the variable that's gonna go away. <coughs> Integral of sine is cosine. So we're gonna have minus 10 cosine, same angle, that angle doesn't change, but we're integrating so we have to take the derivative of this angle with respect to x, that derivative is pi over five, and we're gonna divide by pi over five. Multiply by five over pi. And that's on the interval of zero to t. So, now we're gonna plug in Oh, this is funny, I just noticed this. We're doing part B first. You need to do part B to answer these questions. Huh. Right? What is the population 15 years later? Well, we need to find our future value of population before we can plug in the 15. So, yeah, we're doing part B first. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug in our T and our zero. Let's not try to squeeze it in over there. Seems like a bad idea. So plugging in the T first, we'll move this as a constant now, move it up in front, so that's gonna be 50 divided by pi. Cosine of pi T over five. <coughs> Now we have to plug in zero. We're subtracting off this expression evaluated at zero. That is zero. Minus a minus is plus. Plugging in zero, cosine of zero is one. So it's gonna be plus 50 over pi. So that will be the population at a future t value. Any questions on that integration? <coughs> Are we good with that integration? So the, again, using <coughs> reverse chain rule, plugging in both limits of integration, we subtract off the lower limit. Five times zero is zero, cosine of zero is one, so we're subtracting off 10 over that, which means adding, flip that, and we get 50 over pi. <coughs> so now we can answer the other questions. What is the population 15 years later? And notice that 
we're starting at t equals zero, so 15 years later means we're going to plug in a 15 and plug in a 35 into, into this. So part A, p of 15 equals p of 35 equals, and you know how to plug this in. Uh, we don't need to go through that. Plug in 15. Plug in 35. Yeah. Real quick, where'd you get plus 50 pi? I see where you Yes. Get. So <coughs> that pot, that right there, yeah. right? Yeah. So we're evaluate here is the antiderivative of all this. So we plug in the t first, so that gave yeah. us all of this. Mm -hmm. That's when we plug in t. This is when we plug in zero. Oh, okay. So plugging in zero here, five times zero is zero. Plugging in zero here, cosine of zero is one. 10 divided by this, we flip and get a 50 over pi, and it's subtracted. We subtract off the lower limit evaluation, so it's minus a minus, which makes it a plus. <clears throat> and plugging in 15 here is not too hard. We'll get 15 pi over five. That's gonna be three pi. Cosine of three pi is negative one, so that becomes positive. Um, and then plug in 15 there too. That, that part's easy. So there's the summary again, position velocity, all the stuff we've been talking about. Let's go to 6.2. Did you all do any area between curves in Calc 1? Sometimes it's covered, sometimes it's not. Some of you have done it, some haven't, okay. So it should be pretty intuitive once you get the idea of what an integral represents. So the integral of the, of the black curve here would find the area beneath that curve. And the area that is in here is going to be minus one times the integral of the red curve. So the idea is that you can kind of combine that in one fell swoop, and you can imagine little rectangles right here. I'm gonna call that an integration element. So that's a representative element of integration. You can imagine, right, all these infinite rectangles here. And you know that the way an integral works is that you're Adding up, you're adding up rectangles that are getting thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. And the idea is that the integral represents a limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity. And the area of this rectangle, instead of just having a height where the height is the function, we just have to do a, a subtraction to get the height of that rectangle. Because now, the height of the rectangle is going to be the black curve minus the red curve, right? That's the height, upper minus lower. If you're at plus 5 and at minus 2, that height is 7. It's 5 minus minus 2. So we're just going to do upper minus lower in order to calculate the height of the rectangle. And that's what's happening over here. So the width is the width of each rectangle is b minus a divided by, by n. Let me just say one thing. We are not doing Riemann sums in this class. That is Calc 1. We're never doing it again. We'll talk about it conceptually, but we are not doing the trapezoid method, the left endpoint method, the right endpoint. All that's done. All that's development. We'll just talk about it conceptually now. You don't have to do it again. So when we look at this rectangle, the height of it is upper minus lower. And then the width of it is delta x. So this represents the area of a rectangle. And then as n goes to infinity, delta x is going to 0. You take the limit. And the beauty, the beauty is that when you take the limit, you get the integral. The integral represents the area in between. When you take the limit of the Riemann sum, you get the definite integral, and that's going to represent the area between the two curves instantly. So cool. So here's how it works. So we're going to 
integrate, to find this area, we take the upper curve and we subtract off the lower curve. So that's representing a vertical element right there. So I'm imagining this vertical element. That's a terrible element. Um, I guess I'm just drawing blue. So. <clears throat> so that element is just a very thin rectangle. The height of that rectangle is upper minus lower. And then this dx, if you want, you can think of that as the thickness of the rectangle. You can think of it that way for sure. So what we need now are the two limits of integration. So we see for sure that we're starting at 0. So this one is going to be 0 down here. That's our initial, our left endpoint. <coughs> This right end point, so we need to figure out what that x value is right down there. Do we All, set, go ahead. Do we set the two equations equal to mm -hmm. each other? So if we set those two equal to each other, that's how we will calculate the intersection points. So we'll just set them equal. Let's see, let's add the x squareds to that side. Um, I'll subtract 4x over to there, to the right. Divide by 2, factor at an x. So this tells us then that x is 0 or 3. So that tells us the two intersection points, x is 0 on the left and 3 on the right. So there's zero, there's three, whoops, three is right over here, oh gosh, getting messy, three is right there. <clears throat> so that's going to go in up here, and then we should be good to go. So first we'll combine our like terms inside this integral, so we have minus 2x squared, plus 2x, combining our like terms. Got that. Um, is it 4 supposed to have an x? So yeah, you forgot to put Oh, the thank you. And just be yes, x. thank you, thank you. So that is going to be negative 2x squared and then 6x. Does that sound right? Good catch. That's your job. <laughs> Typo strikers. Strike the typos. So we have that. Plug it in zero, non contributor. Plug it in the three. One of the threes cancels here, so we'll get negative 18. 3 squared is 9 times 3 is 27. Looks like 9. So that will be the area of the shaded region. That's how I get rid of the dot. Hmm. Ugh. <laughs> Whoops. Got to be careful with the finger. OK, so 9 is the area of the shaded region. Yeah, of course. On like tests and stuff, do we have to put units squared or anything? Or no, not unless there's units in the problem. In math, we often live in a unitless world. We'll just stay there unless they force us to put units. Okay. Yeah, so if they don't have units, don't worry about it. If they are talking about some field, you know, we're trying to find some region in a, you know, that has area, that has specific units, then we'll do it. Okay. In general, no. Will we get knocked off points on the test if we forget to put units? And the problem has units? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Not many points, but some. Okay. Like a partial point. Little little tiny deductions. Mi micro deductions. Micro. Yeah. Yeah. If a problem has units, definitely yeah be in that habit of looking. Okay. 
especially, I mean, we don't have a lot of, Calc 3 you have more, there's a lot more units in Calc 3 usually. Okay, so, <coughs> regions, we find the area um, between these two. I'll let you two, I'll let you all do it. I'll do the sketch though, just to make sure that you're not going down a rabbit hole. So let's do the sketch together and then I'll let you all work on it. So we're looking at sine and cosine on this interval. So let's go ahead, actually we'll probably get way better than that. So let's go ahead and first look at uh, cosine. So cosine starts up, comes down, and we'll just do a full period and then we'll modify it based on these points. Sine starts up, comes down, and finishes right there. All right, so at pi over 4, sine and cosine are equal. They're both root 2 over 2. So that's where they intersect. So that's going to correspond right here. That will be a pi over 4. 5 pi over 4, that's in quadrant 3. Sine and cosine are also equal in quadrant 3 at 5 pi over 4. And so that's corresponding right to here. And that's 5 pi over 4. <clears throat> Is everybody okay with that? So you should be sort of thinking in your mind a combination of uh, unit circle and rectangular coordinates. Whoops. And so pi over 4 is right there. Sine and cosine are equal. And then also over here at 5 pi over 4, sine and cosine are equal at those two places. Okay, so go ahead and you guys take it off from, take it from here. So find the area between these two curves. You're trying to find that area. Yeah, I do. Yeah. 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 Y
but we can't really combine. Yeah. That's as much as we can combine, like, just like that. So we just take it and work. We just solve it for five four, five five four. So he has the balance, he has the strength. He doesn't have the age. He doesn't have the age. He doesn't have the age. Let's go through this. Looks like everyone's pretty much on track. The hardest part is dealing with all the root twos. So So any issue with that? We see that sine is on top, cosine is butt down below, so sine minus cosine. Yes. That makes sense, everybody? <coughs> And then let's split this. So then we'll do uh, integration. So integral of sine is minus cosine. Integral of cosine is sine. All right, so here's, here, here's the hard part. So <clears throat> at 5 pi over 4, both sine and cosine are negative. So we're plugging in 5 pi over 4 first. So this is gonna be negative root two over two, this is gonna be negative root two over two, and they both get multiplied by minuses. So we'll end up with root two over two plus root two over two. And now we subtract off what happens at the lower limit. And if you subtract off what happens at the lower limit, you can imagine that subtraction distributing and making both of these positive. So it's actually going to be plus cosine of pi over 4, which is positive root 2 over 2, plus sine of root, plus sine of pi over 4, which is root 2 over 2. So we have all that, which is 2 root 2. Does that make sense? Can you, can, you, can you go over that one more time, how you switch the sign? Yes. So when we're evaluating this quantity, we first plug in the upper limit, which is 5 pi over 4. Mm -hmm. Sine and cosine are both negative root 2 over 2. Then they both get their signs switched because of those minuses. So that's how we get these two. I was talking about the, yep. um, when we, when Next we part. So, yeah, yeah, when we subtract uh, our lower limit. So then we're going to subtract off this quantity, so minus all of that, plugged in with the pi over 4. So this minus you can imagine distributing and making this, oops, making okay. that positive and that positive with the pi over 4 plugged in. Gotcha. Okay. Does that make okay. sense? I'm going to just make it crazy to make you two clicks for an undo. We like doing lots of undos. That's not fair. This oh is the eraser. God. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so much quicker. That's uh, so much quicker. Yes. <laughs> okay. Really. Yeah. I'm used to the smart notebook. Smart notebook you can... Do, 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 do. Okay, so there is our area between the two curves. Let's go ahead and look at this exponential 
mess. Exponentials always seem to be a little messy. Let's get a sketch. We like a sketch that helps us to figure out uh, what's going on. Oops. Now I've got to figure out how to get out of that without drawing something. There's got to be a way. Okay, so e to the x is going up, and it looks something like that. X equals zero, that's the y-axis, looks something like that. This is an exponential decay with a y-intercept of three. When x is zero, e to the zero is one. One times two plus one is three. So that's somewhere up here, that's the y-intercept. And it's an exponential decay, so it's shooting down towards the x-axis. So that's as neat as we need. We don't have to get any more precise than that. The region we're trying to find the area of is right in here. <clears throat> so, if we imagine our vertical element, so this is our integration element. I think I can draw it like this rectangle tool. Yeah, that looks pretty good. <clears throat> so, okay, so there is our vertical element, our integration element. We're imagining that rectangle sliding across the region. We need to know the height of that rectangle. The height of that rectangle is going to be the upper function minus the lower function. And then we also need to know what that little... You put the eraser. We need to know what that little point of integrate that little point of intersection is, right there. So that's what we have to do. So let's go ahead and set up our integral, and then we'll find our limits of integration. Okay, so we are going to integrate. We're finding area. The upper curve is the decay curve. So two e to the minus x plus one. That's the upper curve. Subtract off the lower curve. The lower curve is just e to the x. Good. Now our limits of integration, we set the curves equal and solve. So we're going to say e to the x, we're going to set that equal to 2e to the negative x plus 1. And try to solve that. So let's go ahead. Having a negative exponent is bad. It's very hard to solve equations with negative exponents. Usually, we want to multiply by something to eliminate negative exponents. What can I multiply e to the negative x by to change the exponent from negative to non-negative? 1 over e to the x. Yeah. Or 2 over e to the x. Yeah, so we could. So one other way, you just talked about over e to the x. You could think of this as 2 over e to the x. So you could think of this e to the x in the denominator. And then if you clear the denominators by multiplying by e to the x. So the other way to think of it is that this is e to the negative x. And if you multiply by e to the positive x, both sides, you'll get e to the x minus x, right? When you multiply those two together, you add the exponents e to the x times e to the negative x is e to the 0, which is 1. So either method of thinking about it. So here we have um, e to the 2x. And then over here, e to the x times e to the x is e to the 0, which is 1. So that's <laughs> 2 plus e to the x. And now we're going to put everything on one side. So this is a standard algebra procedure when everything, when you have a nonlinear equation, everything to the left and factor. Right, that's what we do when we have a nonlinear equation, everything to one side and factor. That's easily factorable. This is e to the x minus 2 times e to the x plus 1 equals 0. 
This tells us that e to the x is equal to 2, or e to the x is equal to negative 1. Can e to the x be negative 1? No. No way, right? e to the x is always above the x-axis if we graphed it, so that is no solution. And this one, if we take the natural log of both sides, we get natural log of 2. So that is what we're looking for. That will be the right intersection point of those two curves. So this right here is natural log of 2. And now we're good to go. Now we've got the left, the left point is x equals 0. That was given. That was given up there, x equals 0. And we'll go up to natural log of 2. OK. Is it clear that we cannot combine those two exponentials? Those are not like terms. Right? They have different exponents. The only way you can combine powers is if the powers match. Yes. Those cannot be combined. So the integral. The integral of this is itself. The integral of an exponential is always itself divided by the derivative of the exponent. So negative 1. So we'll divide by negative 1. And then the integral of 1 is x. The integral of e to the x is itself. So we have that. Plug in our upper limit of integration. So we have negative 2 e to the, let's just do it slowly. We'll just plug it in first. And then we'll do the simplification in a minute. So I've just plugged in natural log of 2 for all the x's. And then we're going to subtract off this antiderivative evaluated at 0. So subtract off, and again, let's put the minus, and let's just do it step by step. So this is negative 2 e to the 0 plus 0 minus e to the 0. OK, so up here, that negative sign, we need to pull it up out of the way so that the e and the ln can cancel. So this will be. 2 to the negative 1, which is 1 half. So we have negative 2 multiplied by that. Negative comes up. 2 to the negative 1 is a half. The e and the ln cancel. Natural log of 2, can't do anything with that. Here, the e and the ln cancel, so we have minus 2. Now we come down here. e to the 0 is 1, so negative 2 with a negative distributed is positive 2 doesn't contribute. Minus 1 with this minus distributed makes a plus 1. So that, <coughs> there are all the pieces. This is negative 1 right here. Positive 1, those cancel. And then these also cancel. So our final answer is just natural log of 2. Any step there you want to? Is that a minus sign in front of the parentheses right there? This right here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it's the antiderivative evaluated at the upper limit minus the antiderivative evaluated at the okay. lower okay. limit. All right. We did it. I'll do that. So. Let's, this will be our last slide, and what we have here is curves that are functions of y instead of functions of x. So when we're looking at trying to find the area between two curves, 
there's times where integrating with respect to x makes sense, and there's times where integrating with respect to y makes sense. It all depends on whether the region, I'll use the expression horizontally simple. And by horizontally simple, what I mean here is that this is horizontally simple because wherever I draw my element, the, the curves don't change. Wherever you have your element, right, if I draw it, like, where'd it go? <laughs> where'd you that element? the eraser. Oh, did I hit the eraser? Thank you. All right, so let, let me just draw it like that. If I draw that element there, or I draw it here, or I draw it here, the left curve is always red, the right curve is always black. So that is horizontally simple. I just draw a horizontal element, same left curve, same right curve, all the way through. Same here. The red curve is always on the left. Doesn't matter where I draw the element. Same here. So these are all horizontally simple. These are not vertically simple. I can't integrate with respect to x because if I draw the element right there, it's like, oh gosh, red on top, red down below. Here, black on top, red below. You know, over here, I might get to a spot where it's black on black. Not possible to integrate that with respect to x. So when we look at our region, let's go back to our previous slide, we want to look at the region and decide. So here, it makes sense that this is vertically simple because wherever I draw the vertical element, we have the same curve on top and the same curve on bottom. Doesn't matter. It's not horizontally simple though. It's not horizontally simple because if you draw your element here versus here, you have a different right-hand curve. Now, it would be possible to subdivide this right there, and you could integrate and find this upper area and this lower area and add them together. Absolutely, you could do that. Um, but we would like to integrate as simply as possible. So if it's vertically simple, integrate with respect to x. And if it's horizontally simple, we'll integrate with respect to y. And the same idea is going to hold. We imagine a horizontal rectangle instead of a vertical rectangle. And we will end up with the exact same type of integral. We'll end up with the height of the rectangle integrated with respect to a differential. It's just that it's dy instead of dx. It's a horizontal height instead of a vertical height. But it will all be the same in the long run. It's just that we have to write our functions as functions of y instead of as functions of x. So we'll take care of that on Thursday. I will put an announcement in D2L the second they fix my math lab so that you can just go straight in. It should be within the next, it should be this afternoon at the latest. But look in the D2L announcement area. I'll announce it as soon as I as soon as I know. All right, question. Uh, they are in the schedule. So if you go to D2L and uh, um, if you go to D2L under content, this schedule is, we are going to stick to this pretty, pretty rigorously. So under course documents, the schedule is right there. So our due dates are almost always going to be on Monday night by midnight. So Monday night by midnight for most of the homeworks and quizzes, except for a few, I bump onto Tuesday night because like for example here, 9.3, I don't want 9.3 due this night because I want you to be able to ask questions on it before it's due. So for the most part, Monday nights are our due dates. First homework assignment, 6-1 and 6-2, those will be due Monday night. My working. Is it working now? Yeah. Mine is too. In a couple we also had Calc 1 during yeah, the summer. So oh, so you might are, yeah. already have. Did you have Calc 1 this summer? No. Oh, good. Okay. All right, I'm expecting to go back and see wondrous emails from my techs. Excellent. Good. All right, well, I will see you all on Thursday. Welcome back to real college. Thank you. Very excited. Yeah. 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 Yeah.